Five major media outlets, including The New York Times and The Guardian, are calling for the charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to be dropped. In a letter to the U.S. government, the media organizations call the indictment a dangerous precedent that threatens to undermine America's First Amendment and the freedom of the press. They go on to say that publishing is not a crime, something we've said on the show multiple times, and obtaining and disclosing sensitive information when necessary in the, is in the public interest. That's a core part of the daily work of journalists. Criminalizing this work makes democracy significantly weaker. Julian Assange was arrested in 2019 under the Espionage Act following the publication of classified material that detailed corruption, diplomatic scandals, and spying on an international scale. Friend of the show, Glenn Greenwald, responded to the push for the charges against Assange to be dropped, tweeting, quote, good to see the media outlets who profited from his scoops finally defending him. Robbie, That's why do you think see. it took so long? I mean, this is unequivocally good yeah. news. I, I shouldn't yeah. immediately poop on it. No. But I mean, there is this question, like, what is with this timing? Yeah, I, I don't know, but uh, better late than never, I yeah. guess. Uh, they are absolutely right to say what we've been saying for years on the show. The previous hosts were saying it before we were. Uh, it is not a crime to reveal to the information, uh, to reveal to the public information you got that is in the public interest about the lies the government told that contradicts what they said. That is not a crime. That is journalism. That is what the New York Times does. That is what the Washington Post does on a good day. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it's, it's what all journalists should aspire to do. And Julian Assange is not a criminal. He is a hero. And he has been under, he has suffered a uh, horrible, a horrible cost for what he did. He has been, you know, he was trapped in that embassy for years uh, under not thrilling conditions right. and is now actually being held uh, in uh, prison in Britain under terrible conditions. Uh, it's horribly impacted his health. Uh, his, he's his in bad life. state. Yeah, we've talked, uh, we've talked to his, his brother on the show before. Um, it's just, it's awful. Uh, and the U.S. the U.S. government could easily put an end to this. They could just stop this indictment or they could issue a, a uh, you know, a, a blanket pardon right. or commutate or whatever, to any of those things would be fine. They, but they should stop trying to imprison him. They should let him be a free man, and they should thank him for the public service he performed. Yeah, I mean, Glenn has been making this point really consistently about the New York Times and these other papers profiting off of benefiting from these kinds of yeah. stories. And, you know, part of the, the tension that's always existed is this kind of New York Times rule where there are so many uh, publications that could be implicated by uh, Assange um, going down under the uh, Espionage Act. And it is curious, I wonder whether or not some of the conversations we've been having in a foreign policy context about authoritarianism overseas has continued to heighten the contradictions as America wants to demonstrate that it's much more free than other countries like Russia and China, is the fact of how it's treated Julian Assange kind of um, an inconvenient uh, uh, mm -hmm. truth that it's having to contend with more and more. The Obama administration said it wanted to be the most transparent administration in history and then prosecuted a record number of whistleblowers. Mm -hmm. so so you have to, you can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. I think there's a certain, in, in terms of the media, I think there's a certain amount of, um, maybe this is vibes only, I don't know, but <laughs> contempt for a Julian Assange type figure who is who is an independent figure, who, who was not operating yeah, or working for an establishment, like establishment media yeah. property, yeah. was doing his, his own thing. Uh, th there's a certain amount of protecting the prestige of an institution like the Times and the Post, et cetera. So when they do it, it's okay. When so it, it's good, not only is it okay, it's yeah. good, it should be celebrated. When someone you know, outside the bubble does it, it's like, well, yeah. it's, you know, that's yeah. and I also provocative, think that, look, that's contrarian, that's weird, you know, oh, I don't know. For sure, for sure. And, and, and as much as we talk about, and I think especially conservatives talk about cancel culture, it's worth noting that some of the allegations, you know, I think that part of what allowed so many people to walk away from Assange, including journalists who sort of know better, was this idea that he's a bad guy anyway. And some of the Me Too allegations mm -hmm. that had surfaced and that were ultimately discredited stuck in people's minds such that I remember there was an interview done with AOC in the beginning, I think January of 2021 at The Intercept, where she was asked uh, about her support of Julian Assange. The Intercept was obviously an outlet that has been really all on these, on these issues for a long time, founded by Glenn Greenwald. And her 
answer kind of dodged and alluded to the fact that, oh, I don't know that much about him, but it seems like he's unsavory, like basically alluding to those right. kinds of allegations. And I, I think a lot of people have fell into that trap. It's not saying that they were bad people for having fallen into the trap, but you really do hope at least our Congress members, our leftist Congress members in particular, um, keep an eye on the ball yeah. A little more closely. That has that. happened so many times so now many times. that people tainted with Me Too stuff, which can run the gamut, a, the ga all the way from very serious accusations Correct. to you made someone feel uncomfortable once in a social situation, Correct. and then there's no, and it could be a million years. It could have been yesterday. It could have been a million years ago. There could be plenty of verification. There could be no verification whatsoever. The person, but it's just the the whiff of it. Yeah, especially for the Condum left. Doom you. It's because, crazy. Because the left cares. Like the left yeah. actually does want to protect the interests of women. They do. They do want to do the right thing. So when an Alex Moore situation comes along, that was the the right. gay uh, candidate in Massachusetts who had an accusation that went absolutely nowhere, but it ruined his presidential uh, his congressional campaign. You saw this happen with Shahid Buttar, who was one of the only people to ever challenge Nancy Pelosi in her district. Um, uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. reported to be a Pelosi backed campaign to to elevate the accusations against him, which were not. Subs they were the kind of interpersonal types of accusations, nowhere near like the kind of Weinstein type accusations. Um, and I think it, it ends up hurting the left more because they immediately bend the knee. Scott Stringer in uh, the New York mayoral race had mm -hmm. to drop out and was abandoned by AOC and the other leftist. I was just reading him. about, I, so I just found him again, I couldn't recall his name, the author Juno Diaz, mm -hmm. uh, who, who was um, canceled. Uh, it, it was a Pulitzer Prize where he was part of the Pulitzer Prize board and he was canceled for a, a Me Too accusation and you know, he lost all these kind of professional gigs, all these, and then, and he, so it was investigated by the Pulitzer committee and they found, so they like they hired a firm to invest like you would do if it was a workplace mm -hmm. thing. And they found there was no validity whatsoever to the accusations. Yeah. They had, the, the accusation was like that he kissed someone on a cheek in yeah. like a social situation. It, it absolutely collapsed. That's crazy stuff. Yeah, I think it also had a lot to do with people decided that the content of his stories were misogynistic. And there was, I remember at the time there was this argument about whether or not it was so autobiographical that he was basically telling on himself or whether or not you should just read the book as fiction it's and separate it apart crazy. from him and yeah. shit is it right to yeah. blame, you know, attribute all of those yeah. personality traits to him. Yeah, it's, we're, we're still working through, I think, as a society, right. how we want to treat I've never, these I've never uh, ascribed to George R. Martin a desire to burn people <laughs> to death with dragon fire, but. <laughs> Oh, but maybe we should interview him and find out. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. So yeah, we, uh, we've come a long way from the subject of the, the discussion now. Oh, but, yeah, uh, Juliana's but it's not, I, Well, I think it's a, this is a topic that interests us both. Yeah. The, the, over, a little bit of the overboard yeah. uh, Me Too stuff. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, that really did, uh, I think that did have an effect on the coverage from mainstream institutions. Um, and then also the fact that, uh, undeniable, that he was so vocally against Hillary Clinton and would not kind of fall in line to a to a well we have to we have to stop saying things that could be embarrassing to Democrats right. because we can't get Trump 100%. and he did not take that view and that put him 100% at odds with where the mainstream media was headed. Yeah, relatable uh, from my perspective. <laughs> but uh, good news all around uh, for people who love freedom of the press and we will have more rising for you after this.